Hi, welcome again to an episode of That Early Childhood Nerd. I'm Heather Burnt Santi and still have, uh, oh wait, this is a before the other episode, so uh, I have Liz Velasco and Hello. Rixa Evershed today. Hey everyone. Yeah, when you listen to next week's episode, that'll all make sense. You'll know why I uh, had to make those corrections. So we are going to talk about um, a favorite topic for all of us, all three of us, it sounds like. Um, Loris Malaguzzi's idea of the image of the child. Um, uh, starting with, I'm just going to jump into the quote because I think that's what, what we should do. So this is from an article um, called the Im Your Image of the Child Where Teaching Begins. This was published in Exchange Magazine in 1994 when, uh, when he passed away. Um, and the comments are translated and adapted from a seminar presented um, in Reggio Emilia, Italy. So it isn't an article that he wrote. It's um, translation of, of a presentation that he was giving. Um, and it starts right off saying, there are hundreds of different images of the child each one of you has inside yourself an image of the child that directs you as you begin to relate to a child. This theory within you pushes you to behave in certain ways. It orients you as you talk to the child, listen to the child, observe the child. Um, but mostly I think that second sentence, each one of you has inside yourself an image of the child that directs you. Um, the theory within you pushes you to behave in certain ways. Um, I think is is what I had most in mind when um, when I uh, was reading this, rereading this for the conversation today. This is one of my favorite things to think about. I think it um, it can set a person's mindset um, for a conversation. So I use it a lot when I'm teaching or training or um, when um, when we're brainstorming or problem solving about a problem with a child bringing back to mind, okay, what is your image of this child in the moment? Um, and we, we can be very black and white, like, do you think he's competent or you think he's a deficit? But it's not just black and white. It's, it's, it's a whole uh, hundred languages, I guess. It's a whole, it's a whole Reggio deal. Oh, no one's gonna talk. <laughs> I, well, what are I your mean, thoughts I feel like on that, the image of the child? <laughs> that line of that, uh, the, I mean, just the idea of where we start to construct our own image of the child has to come from our own childhoods, right? The messages we received as adults and oh, that sure. we are now imparting and just, and I guess starting with this very beginning of the article, which is a logical place to start, but also not at all how I have my notes. So I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, well, go <laughs> wherever you want to go. You know how the show runs. <laughs> <laughs> it's um it, it's just so critical and just again I think highlights and underlines and bolds and italicizes the importance of educators and anybody who's going to be around children or parents to really have the capability to reflect on ourselves our own experiences and find what was great about your own upbringing and what maybe was not great and what that taught you about yourself what that teaches you about your view of the world and other people in general and how you want to impart to what you want to impart to those children and what you are imparting oh wow <laughs> yeah okay yeah I hadn't made like I I agree with that I hadn't made the connection of the image of the child coming from my own experience as a child that that packs a lot I have to think about that a little bit <laughs> and I think I think how we were treated as children yeah. directly influences how we view children mm -hmm. um I I grew up in the Colorado high country we had um national forests you know 25 million acres as our backyard my parents property like literally butted up against it um my dad was a, a art teacher so he threw pots as like a separate income stream for our family so my mom could stay home so we always had play in the basement or clay in the basement where I could go play with my dad. And he always was very reverential about, is that a word? I don't even mm -hmm. know. Yeah. You guys get. Yeah. Here's um, my position. If you say a word and someone knows what you're talking about, it's a word. Okay. So there cool. you go. I like that. <laughs> um, he was always very reverent, reverent of anything we made. So he would always make sure it was fired. He would offer us, you know, if we were struggling with like getting two pieces to stick together he may show us how to 
make that happen. He just really considered us capable of doing whatever. And I mean, he let my brother at three, he was under the car with him, you know, and he would explain what he was doing. If my brother asked questions and things like that. And I, I do think to your point, Liz is like, I'm wondering now if that's why I do consider children so capable and see them as teachers of me in the same way I may support something that they want to know more about. Yeah, that's Uh, exactly what my mind is going back through all these um, interactions and experiences in my young childhood, my early childhood, especially. Um, I'm like, oh, you know, I was just sort of holding, holding my talent of, of seeing the child as competent as my own achievement, but no, (laughs) I have to give credit. Uh, to the experiences I had as a young child and the people in my life who saw me as competent. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. And I think that loops to kind of very end of the article where it says those who have the image of the child as fragile, incomplete, weak, made of glass, gain something from this belief only for themselves. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I definitely highlighted that piece. I'm just going to read it again. But those who have the image of the child as fragile, incomplete, weak, made of glass gain something from this belief only for themselves and I don't think that that has to be like oh you're evil you're so Mm -hmm. selfish and evil and and hurting children you know that's just that's who you how you see your role is to be the protector or the in charge person or um the filler of the empty vessel if that's been your experience then of course that's going to be what you see and um and it is very much about hmm, something that we gain from the from the practice. This went deep fast. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and like, but doesn't that I mean, we parent the way we were parented, we yeah. teach we were taught, and so dismantling systems is part of the work. Uh-huh. And this speaks to it explicitly of like we consider children as capable as we were considered or our experience says we were. Uh And I do think there's been an interesting pendulum swing from the perspective of, of parenting. Um, Are either of you familiar with Alison Gopnik? Oh yeah. Yes. I love her. Yeah. That gardener and the carpenter book is so good. Yes. And I I'm re-listening to it right now um, on my way to work and she's talking about you know how this idea of parenting has really kind of hijacked what is good for parents and for children and that it doesn't really fit into like a societal mold of what it's changed to and I'm wondering if I'm just old enough to have escaped that as a child and this this generation that um or generations because i mean i had my kids in in activities and all the things because that's what you were supposed to do as mm-hmm. a parent um but also from an educational standpoint of when we consider like no child left behind and all of the the policies that have been put into place that are tied to funding mm-hmm. that directly speak to testing outcomes. I mean, all of that consider children from a deficit mindset. None of it mm-hmm. considers children from an agentic learner or a fully capable human being. Mm-hmm. So that ties back though, to, I think our own experiences of school. So I don't know about your early school experiences, I did great at school as long as like yeah. if I could sit down with the test, fine. Yeah. That was out. That was great. It was <laughs> awesome. And so having that experience myself as an educator, right, going in knowing that like my experience of tests was actually I was not seen as deficit. I was not seen as the problem. Mm-hmm. But, and I could see how someone else with my experience could go into this and have such an easier sight of deficit because we were told, you know, explicitly and not like 
you're great at this and this is what everyone should be doing. Mm -hmm. And then you may argue with somebody, you'd be like, I tested and I was fine. Like it was great for me. Right. right? Yeah. (laughs) And then of course that other person is like, well, it wasn't great for me. And you know, right. Um, Yeah. We have a real tendency to see what the most skilled child in our group can do and think that that should set the tone for everyone else instead of looking at um, the ones that it's more difficult for that our expectations aren't quite right for and making Mm -hmm. adjustments based on that instead of, well, one child is successful under my expectations. So it's not a problem with my expectations. (laughs) Right. Or the way I'm teaching my pedagogy in the classroom, you know, like this, this should be fine because these five children can do it. And is that culturally relevant? Is that rooted in equity or freedom or liberation or any of those things that we know children should, should be able to live inside of? Yeah. That's, I think it was a t- like just a random tweet and I don't know who to attribute this to. So if it was yours, congratulations. I loved it, but I don't remember whose it was, um, anybody listening, but it was just something like um, one of the biggest barriers to school reform is the fact that most of the teachers did well in the system that, that we're perpetuating mm-hmm. kind of like most of our teachers were students in the way that we want to see the image of the child, you know, they, their image of the child is this capable um, student that it sounds like we all three were um, and that's why it's so hard to change practices one of the reasons it's so hard oh you're saying no Rixa that wasn't your experience I'm assuming no I really wasn't which is why I I really have a critical eye on school systems now uh-huh. is because I was I did really well in college because I had I went to the University of Alaska Fairbanks and um, I had professors there who saw that I needed to follow my own curiosity. And so they let me do it Oh wow. but in my high school, middle school, elementary experiences. That was not the case mm-hmm. at all. So I sort of struggled inside of those, those boundaries of nope you have to read Wuthering Heights. I don't care that you're interested in this other book or whatever, you know? And um, so, I mean, I I think if we're treating children as agentic learners, we can say, <laughs> um, I know somebody is going to get mad at me somewhere, but I couldn't get into it. I, just I know couldn't. it's not for everyone. I'm currently in the middle of my billion three read of Wuthering Heights, but I know that it's not for everyone to read. Yeah. Or to I enjoy. should try reading it again as an adult because you don't need man, to make yourself do that. But of course, yeah. Yeah. you know, there's like, like 17 that. different narrators. And there's three different genera. It's, it's a whole thing. There's, there's dialect. It's, it's hard for people I know, but I love it. So I had to make the face. <laughs> We'll, we'll let you. I shouldn't we'll say it's hard it. for people. It's just not for everyone, I guess, is what I want to no, say. No, and, and none of them really were. There was mm-hmm. a lot of um, books that, and I'm a, I'm a prolific reader. Like, I yeah. love reading, but I'm wondering if, if children, students should be, if given opportunities beyond early childhood to kind of direct their own learning, like, here's the the type of book we want you to read go find one that appeals mm-hmm. to you and if yeah. that's a graphic novel or if that's a a Wuthering Heights kind of book you know mm-hmm. like it it we're not going to assign intent or importance on it based on that it, yeah. it just makes me wonder because I would have I did so much better in college when I was allowed to do some of that stuff yeah Okay, but that probably really also contributes to your image of the child now, right? Like your oh, 100%, your experience, but... sure. Cool. I'm constantly the person who's like, no, that child, leave him alone. That child can do that. <laughs> People get so irritated with me. I'm like, um, yeah, he's thirty foot up in a cedar. He's fine. <laughs> he's good. <laughs> good. Yeah, and then I'll say something like, "Yep, if he falls, cedars are built with like these off." so the the branches go like they're like staggered yeah 
So, like, if they fall, they're not going to fall far. Yeah, the thing that makes them good trees for climbing also makes them safer trees for falling. (laughs) Right. He he would he climbed all summer long in flip flops, right? Like, and people are like, "Oh my god, that was so unsafe." I was like, he Uh, never once demonstrated that that was unsafe for him. Yeah, I was a barefoot clee clee climber, tree climber. (laughs) When I was a kid, we had big pine trees that were perfect for climbing. Yeah, yeah, and so. I, you know, and they're like, oh my God, that's so scary. How do you do it? You know, that yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, I trust them. Mm-hmm. I trust them to say what they're capable of. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, I want to share another one that I thought was perfect. Another uh, quote, a couple sentences that I thought was perfect. Um, so he says also, um, school is not at all like billiards. When you play billiards, you push the ball with a certain force and it hits the table and bounces off. And there's a definite way the ball will go, depending on force and direction. Children are not at all like this. (laughs) (laughs) And that's the coolest piece about them, in my opinion. Right. You never know what kind of conversation you're going to get into with a child. Or or where, you know, where their idea is going to take them, like the. Uh, the example you shared in the other episode that they haven't heard yet um the, <laughs> the gray legos set out for building that they take um in a bucket for cooking at, in dramatic play you know we had an idea where that billiard shot was going to go <laughs> they took it completely a different direction i found it really interesting and liz please talk over me if you have something to share <laughs> are you tired of us calling attention to your politeness liz it's okay if you'd like to just keep talking and trust have trust in your image of the Liz <laughs> that I will jump in when Liz. I have things to say. <laughs> Liz is competent there. and will jump in when she needs to. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Um when funny, I'm working on holding space for other people to chat because I my when my brain starts to fire, it's like I, I just gotta get it out. Yeah. Um so the, it's a skill I'm working on, Liz. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's that. So I haven't met you before, and so I'm worried that you're going to be very quiet. I don't want to talk over you because I've known Heather long. <laughs> so that's <laughs> part of it. So yeah. All right. Mutually yeah. established. Yeah. Okay. And I um, clearly don't mind talking because I have a podcast and I teach college courses. <laughs> I need to be stopped is what I'm saying. So please <laughs> jump in whenever you need to. What a fun no, podcast I- for people to listen to. <laughs> <laughs> I was um, thinking of when you were talking about play going in directions that we didn't think about it going in. Um, Our um, preschool teacher last year, she did a locks and keys study with these children because she really wanted to give one of the children a opportunity to have some agency in the class. He, he had a hard time Mm -hmm. with, um integrating into play and things like that and and it was so magical from the perspective of how the other kids had really learned to see him and his authentic self and to find value with some of the skills he brought to the table and um his ability to stand into a leadership role and really take command of the situation And, you know, she had a whole idea in her head when she kind of introduced this based on conversations she had heard from the children over the course of the year. They were just fascinated. Um, Anytime one of the teachers or administrators from the school would walk into the classroom, I mean, I have, what, five or six keys on my thing, and they (laughs) have to know what each one is for and what it'll unlock. And if they're there early enough, they may go with me to unlock things, Mm -hmm. you know, and she had thought it would go in one direction it ended up going into a completely different direction of keeping things safe therefore we're going to lock it and um and it was it was just one in my mind it was just one more way that they were um processing the last two and a half years of mm-hmm. oh. of keeping each other safe and keeping our family safe and we're going to put it over here where magic can keep it safe and it's a magic key it's going to lock it and um safety being a theme that we've seen for a couple of years now that seems to keep popping up uh and her reflection and the teacher's reflection of sitting down and just really thinking about like what 
what were they curious about? What were they thinking about and putting herself into learning mo- mode versus um, saying to the children, we're not going to talk about that right now. We're going to go <laughs> over here and we're going to count eight keys or whatever. Yeah, you know? right. And so I, I think, you know, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but like considering ourselves as learners means that sometimes we just kind of need to sit down and shut up and, yeah <laughs> and let the kids so take hard to do you. yeah for sure um that's one of the things he says is overactivity on the part of the adult is a risk factor the adult does too much because he cares about the child but this creates a passive role for the child in her own learning um, oh, God, that's so powerful yeah it's so true i know that's why these mm-hmm. i know liz said her article was mostly all highlighted we we <laughs> joked before about only highlighting the parts that weren't meaningful and powerful, <laughs> saving some time and highlighter. The the correlations I see, you know, Loris Malaguzzi had the idea for Reggio after Italy emerged from World War II. And the correlations that I see between that and Anji play, um, I'm not sure... I think China has its own challenges um, where it originated from and creating these spaces for children where they're, um, are you guys, you guys are locked up. Am I? Am I I I still here? Okay. But I love how out of the, these two, approaches that really center children as learners fully capable learners Mm -hmm. that come with skills and strengths to a space um out of two different regions of the world but with the same kind of similarly rooted ideas of of children as individual humans like they come with what I just talked about and and that they have contributions to the community space mm-hmm. and they um, will bring ideas that will spark other ideas and it just it continues to build creating kind of the total um, picture of what the space is yeah. and that it's it's not the teacher's job really to create the idea of what the space is and fit the children into it it's it's the opposite Uh I just started to read um oh and I I'm not again I don't have the book with me so I'm not going to have the author's name but it's called Havens of Hope it was just released by Redleaf um press and uh maybe the name will come to me but essentially it's a post even though we're not really post-COVID it's a post-pandemic reflection on the opportunities we have now um, in early childhood. And one of the things that she does in the early chapter, introduction or first chapter, is to make, to talk about how, you know, Montessori's philosophy came out of uh, the turmoil that was happening in Italy around uh, wartime and things. And then Reggio came into being because of a community's decision to come together for children after war and to rebuild community. Um, and then, so, so now the pandemic has ravished, you know, worked its way through the world and uh, made all these these impacts on work on our work with young children. And so now we have this opportunity for something Montessori-ish or Reggio Emilia-ish to come out of it. Um, And so now this is not what that author says, but what that made me think about was the messages I've heard about um, children and working with children in the uh, feeling like we have COVID in the rear view mirror. And it's a, it's a, the image is a deficit again. It's like, oh, there was so much learning loss during COVID. These children are just not as skilled now because of COVID. They've forgotten everything they were supposed to have learned because of COVID. And um, so that, that doesn't sound like an opportunity for me. That sounds very much like an image of a deficit that's very frustrating 
and not, um, well, here we do have the opportunity to rethink what we're offering to children and to, to rethink. I mean, I, I think the opportunity is there. I just think I hear a lot of doom and gloom about it and not like a community coming together like Reggio Emilia might have been. I think this idea of the community, or I mean, if we bring this vision of community coming together too, I think there's so much blame being cast. So not only are these yeah. children in the shadow of this deficit, but it's it's the schools, it's the teachers, it's the systems. And yeah, I am one of the last people to not throw shade at public school systems, but <laughs> I think that this idea of only placing blame and not like, okay, so we do have a lot of complicated factors right now with children yeah. coming back into the school building and teachers coming back into the school building and seeing that just like you said, right, this opportunity to come together and rebuild rather than just keep hammering home this idea of children being behind. Um, I mean, I've seen it in the early learning world with parents coming in who have older siblings who are looking at preschool for their, you know, two and three year olds and their older children are having a hard time in second and third and fourth grade. Mm -hmm. And they're looking for these really strong kindergarten prep programs rather than, you know, what we offer, which is also prepare children for kindergarten when kindergarten is ready for them. But mm -hmm. it's much yeah. broader than going into kindergarten, being able to read sentences, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, we have, we have the power. Um, and I think the image of the child falls into this um, you know, what direction we take this power to create something new now. Um, but we seem really focused on, okay, the old, the, the way we've always done it was disrupted. And, um, and now the children that we have are uh, making it difficult for us to get back to the way we've always done it. Um, right. instead of, you know, really stopping and thinking, okay, these children have been through some shit. <laughs> <laughs> the last couple of years, they've, there's been stress, there's been disruption, there's been uncertainty and fear. Um, and yeah, they haven't had their regular um, uh, indoctrination <laughs> at school. <laughs> so of course, their, you know, their scores are going to be different or whatever. Um, but why not look at, at that the way we always did it instead of saying, how do we get them back so that we can keep doing it that way? It was Shira Leibovitz. Yes, it, yes, yeah. thank you. Yes, sure. I because I have that in my queue in yeah. Amazon, and I was like, yeah. okay, I know, I know that book. Let me let me reach out. Yeah. And one of the things I'm wondering, I really feel like early education or early childhood or child care is being used as a political tool. Oh, sure. As, as well as like oh children are that learning loss and so on and so forth and I don't I wonder if that's even an accurate narrative mm -hmm. I I think we're seeing skill loss as far as how to and wrote memorization loss maybe <laughs> right I think from I'm in a unique perspective because I'm in a preschool through grade 12 space uh -huh. I'm seeing social emotional learning loss. Right. But even that's being like blame. It's like these children are to blame for their social right. emotional learning loss. And it's disrupting mm -hmm. our desire to get moving forward again. So let me, yeah, I think that's a really good point because it's not learning loss. It's just that they haven't been in spaces where they have the opportunity to learn these skills. Yeah. Because they've been home or wherever. And, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. And it's okay for them to need to build that skill set, mm -hmm. even if normally they got it in third grade, but because we were home for all of third grade, they're now having to do it in fourth or fifth grade, you know? Um, and, and I think the politis the politicization of all of these concepts has been so hard from mm -hmm. a teaching perspective because if you have families who aren't willing to engage in the critical thinking around some of what they hear and whatever yeah. 24 or hours have never like, had the opportunity to develop those skills for themselves right <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. right and uh. so I mean that's that's what I'm that's what I'm seeing and yeah. just the the need to pr process this collective trauma mm -hmm. we've all lived through yeah um yeah. from a perspective and I think that's where we need to really root 
the view of the child as capable as yeah. their humanity. I mean, even just to in, even to consider the child in these decisions and processes. But so yeah, he has. There's the section in here called "Finding Our Way in the Forest," where he says, "All of this is a great forest. Inside the forest is the child. The forest is beautiful, fascinating, green, full of hopes, but there are no paths." Although it isn't easy, we have to make our own paths. Um, yeah. And I think that's where we are again right now in history. <laughs> well, and he wrote this, what, 30 years ago almost. Mm-hmm. Gosh, mm-hmm. that's hard to believe. Yeah. 30 years ago was the 1970s, right? No. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he did this speech in 1993. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and we're still ago. wrestling with some of these same things. Yeah. I think that's I think that's fascinating. Yes. But it doesn't matter because we've got the baskets, so we can still be Reggio inspired. <laughs> <laughs> I listened to that episode. I was rolling. I <laughs> was rolling. I was like, well, yes, I have baskets. And yes, I have tree cookies. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Which is fine. That's fine. I love uh-huh. that line. It's shortly after what you just referenced, Heather. Uh-huh. Um sometimes we'll greet each other from far sometimes we'll find each other together within the forest sometimes we make it lost sometimes we'll greet each other from far away across the forest but it's living together in this forest that is important and this living together is not easy Mm. i I love that he's Mm. built in this acknowledgement that we're all going to have these different ideas Mm -hmm. (laughs) of what is right and yeah you know we still need to build this community we still need to build these places for children to grow into themselves and to become citizens of the world and their own localities Mm -hmm. and the goal is continuing to work at living together i literally am having an emotional response to that it it feels very like right here in my heart like this should be all of our mandates yeah like and how dare people pull it to size this like mm-hmm. these are human beings that we never know which one of them might have the cure to cancer in their head or mm-hmm. the the way to solve climate change or any of these things and if we don't give them the space and the time to follow their curiosity they may never get there because they were instead told that they have to memorize a plus b equals c you know and or that everything that you can know is already known and you just have to memorize it you right. know right. um uh that's i think that's probably a paraphrase of a of a piaget quote from class this week but you know this idea that are we are we wanting to teach children to discover new ideas and new new things or are we wanting to just teach them what's already known and a lot of that factors in too um this conversation we had a i'm gonna take a a hard right here um we had a whole conversation the other day i think it'll eventually spin back okay well it better because we stay on topic on this show (laughs) oh i've noticed that about this show (laughs) um but the fact that we root so much of the work we do in the theories developed by middle-aged white men who were studying western european children right of a middle-aged and in class. the case of piaget three of them <laughs> right right and so when you know when we're talking pandemic we we can't not talk about the racial reckoning of the mm. summer of 2020 after yeah. george floyd's murder and i was recently looking um rukia rogers had shared on her highlander um facebook account about the study that she did around george floyd's murder with the children and one of the most powerful pictures was of this little blonde girl working on her i I'd, i'll have to look at it again but if i recall correctly she was writing a letter to either George Floyd or to George Floyd's mother or something about Mm -hmm. how she was sorry or how she would have fixed it so that that wouldn't have happened and um and when we talk about our view of the child 
how many of us kind of had this gut reflex of like, that's too heavy or too big for this three-year-old, right? Right, but yeah. Is it? But is it? Mm-hmm. I mean, these children have already processed race. They started doing that when they were born. They have strong opinions about race at this point, mm-hmm. you know, when they're three, four, and five. And they've heard well, about it. They've heard the stories. They've, you know, they've heard people talking about it. They've seen you know, new murals pop up in their neighborhoods, all that kind of stuff. And so providing them with a space that's safe to ask the questions, Mm -hmm. to process the information. I mean, is there anything more rooted in the identity of a child as being fully capable? Mm -hmm. I mean, it it just, I had tears in my eyes when I was, was, uh, reading the definitions and going through her her process with these kiddos and none of the schools that that I can think of would have even allowed that to happen it wouldn't have been it would have been nixed from the get-go like nope we're not going to talk about that these children are too young yeah yeah um which is just a you know a, a convenient way of saying I don't understand how to process it how to help children process it so we just shouldn't do it yeah as a white woman it makes me very uncomfortable so I'm just sure yeah yeah (laughs) yeah and that was facetiously said just one oh yes oh yes (laughs) um that yes we knew that (laughs) (laughs) throw that disclaimer in there just in case yeah that's right yep what else haven't we hit that we highlighted in this in this article is all of it all um, of it oh yeah. actually i can loop it bit into what rexa just said though um yeah. one of my other highlights um is becoming totally involved is the, is the subheading okay. um, it's a constant value for the children to know that the adult is there attentive and helpful a guide for the child and i think that is so important especially when they're asking those big questions about race and identity and you know all these other things that we don't want to talk about mm-hmm. uh, and just being present with the child and modeling ourselves as someone who is prepared to be there for the child through the many things that they encounter and will encounter and starting off with that relationship with that trust in the child with that image of the child as capable and confident and thoughtful and able able to process too Mm -hmm. with that additional understanding of where they are developmentally right but modeling ourselves as the adults in the room to just be present for that child and not shut down conversation that is maybe going to make us uncomfortable and is maybe going to make us say oh I'm gonna have to send it out home to let parents know this came up today yeah (laughs) (laughs) thinking about all those end of the day conversations you're gonna have to have because this one child asked this one question yeah I had a beautiful conversation several years ago with a group of four and five-year-olds about um if if there was a god if that god created the world and if that world had evolution oh wow Ooh. <laughs> <That'd be laughs> and, uh, that sounds fun tell us how that went Liz <laughs> um the highlight of it for me was when <laughs> it was it much more respectful conversation between the children than I think it would have been between the adults to be honest sure but the absolute like this one child the top of his lungs with the most passion you can imagine um <laughs> there is no god but if you want to believe that it's okay <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh-huh uh-huh there's a lot I in think... that one comment that's, that we can learn about that boy <laughs> also, and your also assumption that like... it was a boy. I don't think I gendered this child oh I assume yeah I, I am bad. I automatically go boy when I'm telling uh, anecdotes and vignettes. I think that's so interesting, though, because at the same time, this child held space for people. Other people. Who yeah. believe differently than yeah. they do. Oh, my gosh. That's amazing. I love right. that. It was yeah. wonderful. Yeah. And so I, I say that not to pat myself on the back, but just to say, like, yes, I have had conversations and then I had to ask my director for a few minutes off the floor so I could just outline what happened (laughs) before pickup (laughs) yeah yeah I love the way Richard Cohen um went like I'll go there with a child but I'm not going to lead a child there Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I thought that that was really a 
powerful way of saying, I value your questions, but also holding space for the fact that your family may think about this differently. And so you can ask me. Yeah. But I won't take you anywhere that you're not going to take me first. Mm -hmm. Like I'll go there with you. And I, I thought, whoo, I actually talked to a couple of teachers about that because I was like, this is a great way to have these difficult conversations to really get at the heart of what the child is curious about and what they already know, what they want to know more about. And then being able to say to a parent, like, this topic came up for your child today. Mm-hmm. You know, they noticed this. This is what I said. And it it seems, while not neutral, it it's a, a really gentle starting place mm-hmm. for some of those more difficult conversations where children are diving into the questions they have about the identity of other family structures of other children of just what society tells us about boys and girls and how gendered you know that it's binary it's not something else right yeah that's another you know a whole other area that we're giving a lot of time and attention to with with our work right now and is being sort of attacked <laughs> by outside forces. Um, but we we trust in the child's competence to make sense of things with information. Like we can give them information, we can show them um, a variety of of different, you know, family structures or ways of of thinking about people um, and trust them to make sense of it you know, being there next to them for when it doesn't make sense anymore and they need a little more information. Um, that's for us and for the families to do, right? We can, yeah. we can, yeah. we can t- keep the family in the loop for those kinds of things. hundred percent, a hundred, maybe alleviate some of that fear, but so it's, it's like race. We think, well, they're too young to, to hear about, um, two moms in a family well they see it in the hallway every day (laughs) (laughs) when that family drops their children off you know they see that every day so no they're not too young to to wonder and be given some some credit for the wondering so I think we'd need to draw a distinction though or maybe boundary around I'm not quite sure Mm -hmm. this idea where a child leads you which I think is of critical importance of course but I think I fear that that could be heard as a little more passive. And I think that part of our role within a community is obviously not to start issues with families, not to <laughs> butt it right up against people's beliefs. Yeah. But I do think that it's appropriate to start with a base morality of all people are valid and yeah. all gender identities and race. I, I, I worry about- right being so neutral and being so afraid of being accused of teaching critical race theory that <laughs> we can't um, butt up against children, the stereotypes that children will naturally form as they try to categorize and understand. Well. Sure, sure. And I think, um, I can't remember specifically the anecdote that you're referring to with Richard, but you know, he wasn't, I don't know that he was even claiming neutrality. He, he was saying, you know, this is this is our position and this is our experience. And I've got the stuff in the classroom, whether it's books with different, uh, uh, you know, cultures and, and family structures and um, whatever, or, you know, what we put in dramatic play, whatever it is, the words we use, the language we use, um, or, you know, pronouns even. Um, but he was ultimately saying, um, you know, but you, you know, you can talk to mom about that when you go home tonight or something like he, Oh yeah. Yeah. He was. And, but, but yeah, I thought about that too. I'll, I'll, I'll claim that now that you've said it um, a while back that, yeah, we're not saying um, to just remain completely neutral until a child asks about a a scary, confusing, um, uncomfortable for adults kind of topic, but. um, It was in the grooming episode. Yeah. I just remembered where it was. But I think I, we can assume more competence than we generally do when we're thinking about children in those conversations. I yeah. agree. Yeah, no, I, Liz, I'm right there with you. In fact, I often worry that I push too hard in some of those spaces of making sure that everything is talked about and represented and and uh, explicit, 
shown as this space welcomes all humans regardless Mm -hmm. you know and Mm -hmm. they belong we love them yeah that's how this works but if a child says does god exist right that's not i'm not going gonna to say take to that child <laughs> yeah i'm not gonna take to say to that child well no but a lot of a lot of people believe it but no <laughs> <laughs> i'm no, gonna go a- tell me more about that yes I'm exactly yeah. going through the roller yeah. Of, oh, yeah crap how am i gonna buy some time with those open-ended <laughs> questions <laughs> I do appreciate that you called that out because yeah. I I think when you're talking about some of these subjects, um, because they are so uncomfortable, it's easy to take that exit, right? And to say, mm-hmm. oh, all I'm going to do, I'm not going to present any of these ideas in my class. I'm not going to ask children to think critically about any of these things. I'm just going to wait until they bring it up. And I think that that's a cop out, you know, it's, it's mm-hmm. saying, um, I'll do it if you make me, but I'm not (laughs) going to do it unless you make me. And so wanting to make sure that we have representative stories, um, Mm -hmm. activities, whatever in Mm -hmm. our classroom is so critically important. And then when a child notices in the story we tell or the um, picture of the family on the wall or whatever it is, then we can go there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, that was a hard turn, right? (laughs) <laughs> hard right turn <laughs> we did go in a completely different direction there but still relevant to the image of the child that started oh, it itself. totally is it, yeah. it it's it's the image image of the child is capable of hard mm-hmm. things yes yeah 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 and or capable of confusion like you know that confusion is okay too we don't have to have a black or white yes or no answer for everything a child in his competence or her competence wonders about we we can um, sort of honor that process and see it as competence. Yeah. Even if we don't exactly know how to respond to it. Can you imagine how confusing it would be for a child who'd explicitly been told at home that men only marry women or vice versa to see a same-sex couple or a transgender couple or, Mm -hmm. I mean, just an LGBTQIA Mm-hmm. um world or in you know having been brought up only in a white neighborhood with no exposure to any other culture like mm-hmm. the process in their head and the immense need for support so that they get to where they they come to the conclusion that these are people worthy of love and all the things mm-hmm I mean, that's, that's heavy. Yeah. 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 I was that person (laughs) until I turned like, you know, 19 or 20 and started to see more diversity out in the world. Like I had no, I had no challenges to my ideas that the world is white and straight (laughs) when I was growing up, like they just, it just wasn't there. So, um, uh, you know, how much, how much richer would it be if I had had someone offering me different perspectives? 100%. Yeah. Who? I'm exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> this has been great, but I've had to think so hard. <laughs> are, are you feeling less grouchy or are you just... I am definitely feeling less grouchy than when we started recording. <laughs> uh, yeah, for sure. Um, still itchy but less grouchy (laughs) I love conversations like this because yes they do make you think but they also absolutely they really do force you to interrogate your own thought processes Mm -hmm. your own um pedagogy in a way that that can help shifts be made Uh and so if there was one thing that I would hope that anybody listening could get from this is just the ability to to think deeper about where they're at with mm-hmm. some of this stuff and and where perhaps they have some curiosity about yeah, yeah. some of what we've talked about yeah and the, I, I'm going way simplified now but um just the idea of the image of a child that you have an image of the child already there whether you know it or not and it's guiding everything you're doing 
gives me a really good tool to sort of pull people, teachers or students into more reflection. Like if they, they suggest a, a solution to something they see as a problem and I can say, you know, I can say, so what, what is it you're thinking about that child that makes you think this is the direction we need to go or what, um, or just talking about, you know, if my image of the child was competence, I might go this way. If my image of the child was, you know, dependent on me for everything, then I'd probably go this way. And it's, it's a, it's a really, even though we went so deep and so complex with this conversation, it's a good, it can also be very simple um, for folks who just need that initial, oh, that's why I assume, you know, if I let go for a minute, everything falls apart. You know, that's, oh, that's why I feel like I um, am a failure if everything isn't, um, you know, if the children aren't immediately building the tower I want to see with the Legos I put in front of them. I actually made that connection as you were talking. I was like, I made that connection too. That's really <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Do you have last thoughts, Liz, or something else we should have talked about that we didn't yet? Um, oh, I do, but I think it's an entirely different episode. So I kind of oh, have okay. to say it, but I just, okay. I, I, in this article, I think it was so interesting. Um, it was actually a relatively brief mention, but the role of the relationships between the adults in forging the classroom environment and forming the image of the child, the image that the child has of the school. Um, and I just wanted yeah. to give that a moment or just to touch on it even, you know, as we're ending, but just the idea time. that are, yeah, exactly, <laughs> that the adults are responsible for creating and facilitating those relationships with the other adults that are in the environment for yeah. the benefit of the children. Yeah, I, we definitely don't talk about that enough in early childhood. <laughs> <laughs> and even in our conversations about relationships being so important, we don't talk about, you know, the teacher, mm -hmm. assistant teacher, co-teacher, whatever connection. So yeah, that is a whole other episode. You'll have to remember it though, because I consistently write down ideas that come up during recording for new episodes and consistently lose the list so <laughs> so I'm just saying that's on you now Liz all right okay <laughs> all right thank you again both for a really good conversation I think people are going to really um respond well to this conversation and um thank you both for giving me different directions to take my thinking it's really fun when that happens um, and thanks everybody for listening. I forgot this was a podcast for a minute. <laughs> it was just a conversation. Um, thanks everybody for listening. We'll be back again um, next week with a new episode of That Early Childhood Nerd.